All right, what's up, fam? Hey, it's good to be back. Here's what I want you to do real quick, okay? Um, before we get going, um, I know that many of you like to dress up for Halloween, or you have in the past. So this is what I would love. I would love for you to turn to your neighbor and tell them either what you're going to dress up as next week or whatever your favorite costume was in the entire span of your life. Ready? Take like just a few minutes and go do that. Hey, and if you are sitting on the back, if you're sitting in the back there, if y'all would come and grab a seat, that would be awesome. Yep, just grab a seat anywhere there. That would be awesome. And be sure to tell them why you liked dressing up like that. You got maybe 15 to 20 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, let me have your attention. How many of you had like, your favorite was like a superhero that you had, like when you dressed up? I know my favorite back in the day was Spider-Man, my little like plasticky um, costume back then. You'd get all like super hot and sweaty and sticky, but it was awesome, and I put, okay. How many of you had like, um, um, how many of you were like, ooh, I like the scary ones? Like, you know, okay, there's a few of you. Anything that looks gross and makes people go, ugh, you love that, okay? Um, let me see, anybody else? Any, um, like, oh, maybe like it was a famous celebrity that you dressed up like, okay, okay, all right. And uh, let me see, I know I'm missing some out there. Uh, what? Oh, inflatable costume. Yeah, one of those, like, like a, and it's, like, really big. Maybe, like, one of those dinosaurs or anybody had any of those with a big fan that inflates up. That's cool. All right. There's something that we love about playing pretend, right? Because you get to, like, put this stuff on, right? And you get to be that person. And, like, when you were little, little, maybe even now, but when you were little, little, if you were like me, I did not need Halloween to dress up and pretend to be something, right? I mean, if I could find a cardboard piece of something, I might cut it up. If I could find um, any piece of fabric, I would tie it around my neck and I'd have a cape. And I, for that moment, was that dude, that hero, that, uh, that mighty morphin Power Ranger, that you name it, I was it, right? But then eventually, I would take that off, right? Because that's not really who I am. It's just kind of what I kind of put on for the moment, right? So we've been talking about clear identity. And there are sometimes we find ourselves putting on things, right? That we're like, okay, maybe I'm in those for a bit or trying to figure out um, what this identity is, but eventually, at some point, we have to take those things off and be who we are. So what we're going to do today is really kind of dive into that, especially as it pertains to our gender and sexual orientation. I'll define those for you in a little bit, okay? Um, but before we do that, I have a game that we need to do, okay? And it is a kind of a uh, it's sort of like, how many of you remember like Where's Waldo books? Okay, okay, you had to find the dude. There's no Waldo here, but there will be, there will be a screen that says a certain thing on it, right? And then you got to look, and then you got to find that thing. You will not have long, okay? Look, try to find it. When you found it, don't scream it out. Just raise your hand like, ooh, I got it. I know exactly where it is, okay? Um, and then, like I said, you're probably going to have maybe... 10 is seconds per, okay? So you gotta be quick. Y'all with me, you ready? Y'all with me, y'all ready, y'all ready? Okay, here we go, let's throw the first one up. All right, we have a ring, ready, go, look. See if you see it. It's tough, I'm telling you. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, few of you, four, Three, two, one. Okay, let's see where it is. You see it? What? You're like, oh, I wasn't looking at that at all. For real? All right, there you go. That's all right. 
Take a look at it. The ring, if you can't tell, it's like right around the top of the carrot, okay? I know it's tiny. I know, I know I get it, but it's, 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 it's right here. Oh, the music stand. Okay, okay. Well, if like the stand's in the way, look to the side. You can see over there. Okay, all right. Here we go, here we go. I know, we like to win, but that's okay. Here we go. Here's the next one. Ready? Got to look for a moth. Ready? One, two, three, go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Okay, we got a lot in seeing it. Four, three, two, one. Show them where the moth is. There he is. All right, we got a few. We got that one. Very good. All right. That was one of the easier ones, but that's okay. Ready? We're going to the next one. We need to find a hedgehog. A hedgehog. Ready, set, go. Find the hedgehog. Find the hedgehog. One. I don't think it's blue. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Look at the left edge. There you go. There it is right there. He's really tiny. There's like his nose and his little hedgehog hair, if you can't see it. His hedgehog hair and his nose. Okay. You got it. Okay. All right. Now we need to find a dancer. Ready? Here we go. Go, find the dancer, find the dancer. See if you can find it, find the dancer. But, ooh, somebody was fast. Oh, we're getting good, okay. Five, four, three, two, one, okay. Show them where it is. Oh, 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 I know. She's like this. Okay, that's how she is, all right. All right, we got like three more. Okay, we got two ghosts and then another one as far as I can remember, okay? So, ready? One, two, three, go. Fine. Good. Don't tell anybody, just raise your hand. Five, four, three, two, one. One. All right, all right, that's okay. This time you get another chance to find a ghost because, you know, they're kind of invisibly. So we'll give you another chance. A little different ghost. Ready, set, go. This one's a little tougher. Again, the ghost is not blue. Five, four, three, two, one. Up in the corner, there he is. Or she right there. Hi now, looking like one of the skeletons. Okay. This next one is really hard. Like, I have looked at it a few times, gone back and still trying to find it, and it's been a little tough. Okay? You need to find a cat among all these bats. Ready, set, go. Yeah, it's a cat. I know. They all look like cats with wings. Five, four, three, two, and one. Oh, like some of y'all like, oh, I found it. Oh, I wasn't pointing there at all. <laughs> that happens. Okay, but see, it's right here. It doesn't have any wings. All the others have wings and such. Okay, give yourself a round of applause for playing the game. In this game, we were trying to find something very specific. Some sort of image, some sort of um, creature, this identity, very specific. We're looking for this thing, but it's amongst all this other stuff. All these other things. They kind of look familiar, they kind of look the same, and the thing that we're looking for kind of looks like it, but it is different. When we're talking about identity, especially as it pertains to our identity as compared to what the world tells us, we are looking for something very specific. And sometimes it's kind of difficult because it's amongst all this other stuff. So today, we're going to talk about that, okay? We're going to kind of dive in and go, okay, if there's a certain identity I'm supposed to have, how do I find it? 
and, and what is that supposed to be? And especially as it pertains to my gender and my sexual orientation. And I'm going to define those for you in a minute, but we first need to rewind and define what identity is. So we can put that slide up. What identity is, is this. It's the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. Or simply put, it's who you are. Okay? It's who you are. And a lot of times, you know, when we say, hey, so who are you? We may say, oh, my name is Tuan. Um, sometimes I start talking about things I do, like on my job, I'm a student minister. I like to uh, um, play basketball, work out, I ride bike a little bit. I have family, right? And so there are a lot of things around that. But at the core, there is something that's in me that can be taken away. You know, there may be one day that I get old enough that I won't be a student minister anymore. Okay, there may be one day that, um, uh, God forbid, but if something were to happen, I would not have a family, right? That could happen. And all those things could go away, but there's something deep in my center that God has given that I believe that stays with us forever, which is our core true identity. It is truly who we are. When everything else is gone, that doesn't go away, Okay. And in this world, there are times where there are certain identities or roles that are said, you should be this or you are this because you did such and so. So one, first thing I want to do is I want to define when I said sometimes we um, consider identity as far as our sexual orientation. Let's just define that word so we know what it means. All right. If you put that up, please. All right. So sexual, what is sexual orientation? A person's identity as it relates to the gender or genders that they are sexually attracted to. So here's the thing, okay? We are drawn to different people, okay? And there are times where, um, depending on who we're drawn to or how we're drawn to, we carry that with us. And our world says that is an identity. We'll deal with that in a moment. But when we talk about orientation, it's just what are or who are you attracted to? You follow? That's the simple definition. If you're with me, nod like this. Okay? If you're not with me, go. Okay, I think, okay, there's a couple who don't. Okay, so really, again, it's just so if there's an attraction to someone, that's it. That's the definition. Okay? We're going to look at the next one, too, as well, because we need to understand these as we go on because we'll dive in deeper. The next one is gender identity, okay? Okay? And this is how someone perceives his or her gender, okay? So, <clears throat> you may have run into some people. I don't know if you have or not. But there are, like, for myself, I'm a person. I'm a dude. I feel like I've been that way. It makes sense. I feel comfortable that way. There are some who, in their skin, for whatever reason, how they feel doesn't match what they look like biologically, Okay? And so they're kind of dealing with, well, I know that I'm in this body, but I don't feel like I'm this gender. So when it goes to what gender identity is, is that gender that you go, I feel comfortable with, whether it's what you look like or not. Are you with me? Not like this. Okay? If you're not, shake your head. I really want to know. You don't just have to nod just because, like, oh, he said nod, so I'm nodding my head. Okay. All right. Excellent. So... There are a lot of things out there that are speaking to us and saying, well, guess what? If you do this or you feel this way, then you must be and you fill in the blank. Okay? If you are attracted this way, then you must be, you fill in the blank. If you feel this way about yourself, then you must be, fill in the blank. And what I want to do is identify some lies that... I believe that are out there because there are things out there that try to tell you this is what you should be or this is who you are that I truly believe they don't have any right to speak into who you are. Okay? And so if you don't remember or if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, there were a few just kind of basic identity lies that were out there. And I'm going to go over them kind of quickly and then we're going to throw them up. And here they are. One is I am what I have. Okay? Which basically means, you know, I, I kind of feel a certain way about myself because of the things I own. 
if I got a sweet ride or I've got the newest um, gaming console or I've got the best kicks or whatever the case may be, then I put those on or I get in that car or my house is big and I'm like, what? I'm the man. I'm the boss, right? That's an identity that I'm kind of putting on myself because of what I have, right? But it really doesn't really mean a whole lot. Doesn't mean I'm the boss, doesn't mean I'm the best. It just means I'm a dude with that stuff. Make sense? Yeah? All right. The other one was, I am what I do. Okay? So if I'm like super duper smart in school, and I'm like, yes, I'm a genius, and all of you peons cannot come up to my knowledge, right? You're like, okay, you might need to come down a little bit. So, okay, you're smart. Yay, okay? But it's not really your identity because you get some head trauma and that might go away. It's just the truth, right? Okay? And here's the third thing. I am what others think of me. And this is a really tough one, okay? Because often we are looking to our peers and even sometimes those above us who are speaking things about us and to us that just aren't us. That just aren't us. As if my buddy, who is the same age as me, gone through the same things I've gone through, can say, hey, yo, Tuan, you are, I don't know, you are the GOAT. Somebody said the GOAT. Okay, if you've seen me play basketball, you know I'm not the GOAT. I ain't bad, but I'm not the GOAT. All right, you hear me? And so these are things that um, their identity lies because they really have no right speaking into us. But there are a couple more, and these ones that we're really going to dive in today. That I'm saying there are cultural identity lies. Okay, when I say culture, it means it's just kind of what we hear around us. As we're walking, as you're going along, as you're watching the television, as you see billboards, as people are talking around, it's just kind of in the air you breathe and in the circles of people you hang with, these are the things that come out, okay? So this one is, my identity is whatever I decide it is. Whatever I think it is. I mean, it's me, right? Why can't I just figure out who I am, okay? And that's an interesting deal because you're like, well, I mean, I don't know that anybody else in the world knows you better than yourself. But I'm going to throw this out. Everything that's created, okay, everything that is created tends to be defined by its creator. Okay? What is this? Music stand, some would say a podium. You could use it as a music stand, not technically a music stand, but it's typically called a podium. And people use it to speak from, hold notes like I have, right? That's what it was designed for. Now imagine if I took this to a body of water near your house, maybe a pond, a river, stream, a lake, and I go, you know what I'm going to do with this? I'm going to go kayaking on my podium. I think you'd come and watch because of how much of a disaster it would be, right? Because this is not designed for that. It's a podium, right? And so if the podium had a mind, it couldn't say, I'm a kayak now. Let's go ride. You can say, okay, you may think you're a kayak, but you're going to sink like a rock. And you're not even a rock. Does that make sense? And so if we feel like, oh, my identity is whatever, whatever, whatever you feel, whatever you think, what, what on the inside is going on in you, you know, that's just who you are. That is what our culture is saying. You hear me? But remember, you didn't even know your name until someone told you. You hear that? Right? And so, as, as great and superb and superior as it feels to say, I'm the boss of me, I can say who I am, when I am, how I am, it's just not the truth. 
okay? Here's another one. I want to put it up. Cultural lie. Then There we go. My urges and my desires decide my identity. Okay? Basically, that may, you may hear it in the world like, you know, if it, if it makes you feel good, then what's the problem? It's just who you are. Just do it. You got those feelings. Just let it play out. Just do whatever. You know? And here's the wild thing about that. Here's one of the wild things about that I'll say. If our urges decide who we are, then if you're like me, my urges may change within a few minutes and not just days. And so if my feelings are changing, then all of a sudden my identity is changing all over the place. I'm here, I'm this, but now I feel like this, so I'm this, and now I feel like this, and so I'm this. All right? And if you want to be confused, let your feelings lead the way. I've seen toddlers, I've seen a lot of kids in my life, and I've seen a few toddlers especially. There's one little boy who just loved the dog food. Have you ever seen any toddlers like that? Like, if you didn't watch him closely, the toddler would be going over to where the dog food was, and this was the bowl, you would find the toddler butt up in the air and face in the bowl like this, right? And you're like, no, come out. And you're like, no, and get that all out of here, man. You wipe out of your mouth, and it tries crying, and it's reaching and reaching for the dog food. That's an urge this toddler has. So if we go by culture that says my urges and desires decide my identity, then we're saying that young man was a doggy. <laughs> right? Because that's the urge that he had. And so he just kind of went after it. And we laugh and see it because that seems like an extreme, but I'm telling you, this is what our culture says. If you feel it, then it must be who you are. And it is a great way to be very confused and very disturbed and really end up with a bunch of questions instead of answers about who you are. We're going to look at another one. We can put that up, okay? It says, my desires control me and not the other way around. I don't know if you've ever had any any desires or things that just felt so strong and you couldn't stay away. Maybe it was a sibling, and you and your sibling are always at odds. And every time you're with them, you're around them, they're doing something to bother you, you're doing something to bother them. The next thing you know, your urge is just to knock them out every time you see them. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all are like, mm. some of y'all like, I can't say, I can't make too many faces because my sibling's in here, but, right? Some of y'all are like, okay, I'm trying to keep it, trying to keep it down, but you know what I'm talking about, okay? The world talks about things like self-fulfillment, self-identity, self-satisfaction. We got to make sure that we have, we, you know, we take care of ourselves. But listen, when we are following Jesus, he takes that word self and he puts them in front of words like denial. Self-denial. Like, I'm going to deny myself of this thing because that's important for me to stay away from the be who I'm called to be. Or self-sacrifice. You follow? And our culture, which I get it, especially if there's if those who don't have God as a center or a compass to guide, what else are you going to use to guide it except how you feel or what you think? But for those who are believers, those who have called Jesus Lord, we have something more than that, and that's the Spirit of God. I will dive into that a little bit more later. But I'm telling you, 
we are not meant to be controlled by our desires. Matter of fact, if you realize, if our desires control us, we are not free. We are slaves. You get that? If something controls you, you are a slave to it. If the world says, just go with it and do whatever, just how do you feel? And just let it go. You don't have to try to pin that down. Don't suppress it. Let it out. And you're just like, I can't do any different. Then that is not freedom. It is slavery. All right. So those are some of the cultural lies that we have when it comes to identity. I also want to share some religious lies that sometimes we as a church have believed, kind of dovetails into those others. But you're like, what, in the church? Like, we're, we're buying into some of this? And some of this we do. And here's one right here. It says, my urges and desires are automatically sinful. If I have a thought that maybe something God doesn't want me to do, or I'm tempted by it, then all of a sudden, I'm terrible, is what some of us may have heard in a church or by someone who is religious. And hear this. We will all face temptations and struggles and trials of many kinds. It doesn't mean that we're sinful. It means we're human. We live in a body. We live here on the earth. And things on this earth aren't all that great. We long for a heaven that's beyond. And so until all those things are made right, there are things that we will deal with while we're here. Because that's where we live and we're human. We have needs and there is, I will also say this, and there is an enemy who is throwing out lies to us, telling us those things that are tempting us are good things for us. If you know the story of Adam and Eve, there was fruit. They were told not to eat of it. Satan comes along and says, hey, are you not supposed to eat of that, really? Talks to Eve, says, no, we're not supposed to touch it. And he says, or we're going to die. And he first thing he says, you're not going to die. You're just going to be like God, knowing good and evil. She heard that lie. And then she stepped in. It may have been tempting before, but it wasn't until she took it that it was sinful. Do you follow? And so when we are here, I don't want you to go away and go, oh, I've had these thoughts. I've had these feelings. I am automatic. All those feelings and those things, those temptations, I am such a terrible person. That is not from the Lord. Do not take that home with you. Do you hear me? Do not take that home with you. Here's another religious identity lie. Good followers of Jesus don't have these problems. I mean, if you were really good, I mean, you'd have your Bible with you all the time. You're just reading it all the time. You're praying all the time, right? You're talking to people about Jesus. The Holy Spirit follows you around. You got a halo. You touch people. The Spirit comes on them. You are a good follower of Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, if you struggle, then you might need to, like, straighten yourself out. You know, I mean, I wouldn't tell anybody about it, but go work on that and then maybe come back. That's a lie straight from hell as well. Because what happens with that is, if you're trying to be a good follower of Jesus and you trip and fall, which you will, the word says it, we know it, which is why Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was raised. If we fall into that, then what we end up doing is not living out the life that God calls us to. What, he, what we end up doing is we end up hiding from God because no one can measure up to that. 
okay? Here's another. People who experience same-sex attraction or gender identity confusion are bad people who must be shunned. There are some religious folks who think that because somebody is dealing with same-sex attraction or gender identity, then they are the cause of all of our problems in the U.S. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say that. If it wasn't for them, then we'd be okay. <laughs> that is not true. It's not true. Hear me say that with all my heart. It is not true. If you follow Jesus' life and you read in the Gospels what he does, those people who the world shuns, those people who are outcasts even by religious folks, you know what he does? He goes out of his way and he seeks them out. And he goes and he is friends with them. You know what the religious people said about Jesus? They said, he's a friend of sinners and tax collectors. Those are his buddies. That's who he hangs out with. And so people who say this religiously, they don't understand what Jesus is about. Because he didn't come to heal the healthy, but those who are sick, those who need help. You know the story, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, wee little man was he, all right? Chicken more tree, all right, all right, so we're like, yeah, I remember that song, I was in my jam back in the day, all right? He seeks him out, he was like the worst of worst to the people around. Jesus calls us to love everyone, everyone. So those are some of the religious identity lies. We've gone over some cultural lies. These are the things that get in the way. These are the things that kind of blind us from who God is really calling us to be. Now, we played the game earlier, and we're going to go back to it. You're like, why are we going to go back to it, Tuan? Just, just bear with me. You're going to have a lot less time. Okay, you've already seen them, right? Okay, so we're going to throw it up. I'm going to give you like maybe three and a half to five seconds, depending on how we're doing, okay? When you see it, raise your hand, okay? We won't stay long on it. We'll go to the next one, and we'll get through that, and you'll see why we'll do it in just a moment, okay? Here we go. The first one is a ring. We know it's a ring. So the thing... When you see it, put your hand up. Man, that was really fast. Three, two, one, put your hand down. We're going to the next one. The next one is a moth. Where's the moth? It's not blue. <laughs> All right, y'all see it? Three, two, one, put your hand down. We're looking for the hedgehog. Where is the hedgehog? Do you know, do you know? Do you know where it is? Point to it if you see it. One, two, three, go. Where is it? It's right there. The dancer. You remember the dancer? I made a cute face of the dancer. All right, y'all y'all like, man, we, don't, we haven't even gone to the next one and my hand's up. I know exactly where it is. Show the thing. Three, two, one. There it is. Okay? Keep going. A couple more. We've got first ghost, ghost number one. Show the, show the slide. Three, two, one. Little Casper right down there. The next one, ghost. Three, show it. Three, two, one. Where is it? Up in the corner. There's where it is. The last one, the cat among all the bats. Three, two, one. Where is it? Right there. Now tell me this. Tell me this. How do you know, how did you know the second time around where those things were? Gave the answers. You remembered where they were. You knew what to look for, right? The first time, there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of this, right? And you're trying to find it, and I was counting down, and you're like, oh, there it is, I find it, okay. This time, it was like, Man, you don't even have to go to the next slide. I know exactly where it is, what it looks like. And what we're about to do in our next part of of this talk is this. We are going to look at what the truth is. Because I'm telling you, you can put that slide up. 
when we know what is the truth and how to identify it, it becomes a whole lot easier to know what our identity is, where it comes from, and how to take it on. We don't have to search through all these other things and try all these things out when we know what's true. Those who are studying how to recognize counterfeit dollars, counterfeit bills, there are people who do that, that's their job. They don't study the ones that are wrong. They study the right one, and they know that one so well that when something is off, they can identify it. And so what we want to do is really look at what is the truth? What does God really say about who we are? And and I'm just telling you, if you don't know, that's where I believe the truth is, is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we're going for that, that is what we're looking to truth for. And this is the first thing that I want you to know. It's that God's creation is good. I'm going to say that again. God's creation, it is good. And I don't mean like, you know, you ate something, you're like, ah, oh, it's all right. That was all right. You know, I could eat it again. But, you know, hmm, yeah, maybe a few things. When we say it's good, we mean exceptional. We mean it's the thing that you want and you could eat that forever and not have anything else. It's that good. So when we say God's creation is good, that's what we're saying. And when we say it's good, we're saying God has created you good. That means you, exactly how you are, how he designed you, is good. This is a passage that it, where God looks at what he's created. Let's throw that passage up. This is in Genesis chapter 1. If you have a Bible and you want to turn, that's like the first, couple, first page. Okay? Verse 31, it says, Then God looked over all he had made. This is at the, like the end of the seven, six days of creation. He looked over it all. And he said it was very good. Like when we started off with that meal, your dream meal, and you take a bite into it and you go, man, that is so good. That's very good. God is looking at what he's done and he's smiling. And when he's smiling, he knows that you are, you need to know that you are a part of that smile. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we don't feel like we're that good. And if I'm talking to you in the room, I want you to hear this. God looks at you. He loves you just how you are. I'm going to say it again. He looks at you and he loves you just how you are. He created you that way. And it's awesome. Do you hear me? It's awesome. Here's the next one, a truth that we need to know, is that God defines me. I kind of spoke to that a little bit when I talked about things that were created, when I was talking about the little podium here, right? Our creator, our God, he defines who we are. If I make anything, I make a song, I make an airplane, paper airplane. I make um, a little little mud cake. <laughs> I've defined what it is. Have you ever, have you ever <laughs> seen a drawing from a, a like a little little kid who's just first learning how to draw, right? And they're so excited about their drawing, and they run up to you, yeah, and they start waving it, right? And you're like, okay. And you're looking at it, right? Especially if you're a parent type, okay? And you're like, oh, it's so awesome. What is it? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Because you're like, and they tell you, it's an elephant. And you're like, okay. (laughs) Right? They created it. It may be a weird looking elephant to you. But to them, the creator of that squiggly thing that they call an elephant, it's an elephant. They created it. They get to speak into that. 
And what I did as a parent, I was like, okay, great, that's awesome. Thank you for showing me your wonderful elephant. Didn't look like what I thought it was, but they created it. You follow? God defines me. He created me. From dust, breathed the breath of life into me, gave me my gifts and abilities. He defines what needs to be done with those things. Here's the next one. My creator defines, he defines me, but he defines me with physical realities of my creation. Here's what that means. <clears throat> when God created, let's go to that verse, that passage is coming up, okay? When God created humans, he didn't create us all the same. Not exactly. So God created human beings. He created in his own image. So in case you didn't know that, you're created like God. That's a part of who you are. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He has design for you and how he's created you. And part of that design is the body that he puts you in. And that is okay. Because if you remember, we believe that God's creation is good. So however you are, male or female, that's a good thing, and it's okay. It may take some time to come to it and be like, okay, I feel okay about it because of all the things in our culture that may tell you all the different things, but I'm telling you, the way he's created you is good. It's great. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And he has great design with that. Let's go to the next one. This is another truth. My creator defines sex and marriage. Okay? God designed male and female. He had a way that our sexuality and marriage should go together. And this is what it says in the scriptures. Let's take a look at it. And this is Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 19. It says, haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied. They record from the beginning that God made them male and female. And he said, this is why it explains a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. And since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. If you see this, you need to understand he's got a design for how this works. And he's got a design for a unity that is there that is super special and right. It's so special and right that the other parts of the scripture, it defines that unity a lot like Jesus and the church are supposed to be one eventually. So when we fall into, into agreeing with our creator as how he defines sexuality and marriage, then we get to experience the awesomeness of his design. I like sport cars. I don't know if you do. Okay? I like the really fast ones. The ones that are kind of low to the ground. The ones that immediately the cops are watching because they know this person is probably going to drive fast because he's in a real sports car. My first car was a sports car. It was a Nissan 280ZX. You're like, I don't know what that is. Just know it was awesome. It was a T-top. We could take those off. The sun could come down. And it was a wonderful ride for me. Okay. Now, the makers of sports cars designed them for the road. Some even for the track. Right? Let's say I'm having a wild hair. I want to get wild and crazy. I want to do something that's super cool. So I want to take my sports car off-roading. I've heard off-roading is awesome. I hear about the monster trucks and the man who says, and there it goes, monster truck rally, right? And I'm like, I want some of that. And so I take my sports car and there I go, and I'm just driving. I'm like, yeah, right? When I get done, what's wrong with my car? It's destroyed. 
Here's why. Because the designers of the car did not make it for off-roading. If I would have used it for its said purpose, I could have gone fast, enjoyed the open road, not the open road, enjoy the track because on the open road there's cops and there's laws. Don't speed, okay? And so I could have enjoyed it on the track as it was designed. You follow? But because I decided to take it out of what it was designed for, I may have fun in it while I'm hitting the bumps, but I won't be able to use it anymore. It's destroyed. You follow? So when... God has a design for us in our sexuality, in marriage, and male and female. When we fall in line, we get to experience the wonderful joys of living exactly how we were meant to live. It's like a fish in the freshest of waters. All right, I think this may be my last one. Let's throw that next one up there if you don't mind. Here's the last one here, I believe. My creator doesn't ask me, and you really need to hear this. He doesn't ask me to eliminate desire. But he invites me to surrender to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit order it and direct it to the right things. Those of you who have been in church for a while and you've heard right and wrong things to do. You kind of know what it's like to have this desire or plan on doing something, and you're like, I'm not supposed to do that, right? But it's like, what, what do I do when those things come up, okay? And I think often what we try to do is we just try to, to, to just take our desire by the throat, say, get down, and put it away. That's what we do with it. You know, try to just, no, don't, don't do that. Don't be that way. Don't be that way, Twan. Not going to do that anymore. You fall like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay? So you pray. You're like, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to work hard. Hmm, I'm going to be a good Christian. And next thing you know, you go out. And you run into the temptation again. Poof, fall on your face again. You're like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? And so you work harder. That is not what God is up desires for us to do with these desires and our temptations and things. What he wants us to do is he wants us to give those over to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit guide what we're supposed to do with those, what those desires are, where, how they're supposed to be filled out. Let's look at the scripture. So it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 and 23, through 24. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. This is what God has in store for you. Put on your new nature, created to be like God. Hear the identity words in there? Your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. This is what happens when we give our desires to the Lord. The Holy Spirit does stuff in us, and the fruit of the Spirit begins to to show. And we end up showing that we have love for people, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And those things begin to well up in us, and we start living in those things. Because it's not we've worked so hard to do it, but it is that God has done a move in us through his spirit. And that's the way he's designed it from the beginning. For us to commune with him, our spirit with his, moving in line with what his will is. Hear that. Because some of us will leave this place and just go, okay, I hear that, Twan, I'm not supposed to do these things, but I don't know what to do with them. I'm telling you, God tells us, you just give them to the Lord, and he's got you. It will take time. This isn't an overnight thing. The big preachy word for it is called sanctification. It's God making you holy, making you exactly what you were meant to be. 
created like him. So real quick, here's what we just went over about the truth. Because when we know these things, it'll be able to, to know what those things are and go after those and not be thrown by the things that aren't true. God's creation is good. God defines me. My creator defines me with physical realities of my creation. My creator defines sex and marriage. My creator doesn't ask me to eliminate desire. He invites me to surrender it to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit order it and direct it into right things. I want you to stand up if you don't mind. And I'm a, I know that a couple are going to. We're going to worship for a little bit in a moment. And if I can have those, those come up. We're going to worship for a bit. And as we worship, I want to give you the opportunity to spend time with God. And here's what I want you to do. In fact, I want you to close your eyes. And if you remember when we were with Alexandra earlier, she had us go to this safe place, right? And that Jesus was there. And God will speak to us. He wants to tell us. He wants to talk to you. It may be a simple thought. It may be something that was said tonight. It may be something, a random scripture. You say think it's random, but it all of a sudden pops in your head. As those things occur, that is the spirit of God. Listen, all good things come from God. And so... As these things come up, especially if they're leading you into the Lord's will or into good thinking, into into who he says that you are, know that that's from God. Don't second guess that. If it's condemning, if it's um, um, it's filled with angst and, and, and heaviness, that's probably not from God. Let it go. And here's a simple question that I want you to ask God. God, tell me who I am. Matter of fact, why don't you put your hands out like this? I say, God, tell me who I am. I'm going to say it and you say it after me. God, tell me who I am. One more time, God, tell me who I am. Say, God, I'm listening. Please tell me who I am. The man's going to lead us in worship. Our, um, our group leaders are going to be around. You'll see them around. They'll just be praying. There's something that happens when we pray in the spiritual realm. We don't see it often. But I'm telling you, God hears the prayers. It says in Scripture that they go up to his altar in heaven. And he responds. So he's moving in this place. We're going to worship for a bit. And then uh, when they're done, I will close this out and give us just a few instructions of things that I want you to take home with you. But right now, All you're simply asking is, God, tell me who I am. Let's worship.